using the MATLAB function TLCALC, or Transmission Line Calculator. So in our previous video, we went through the numerics of actually how TLCALC works. And to simplify all this, this is all lumped into a single function, and you really don't have to know anything about the numerics, but it was good to know sort of what's happening underneath the hood. But all this function requires you to do is just draw a picture of the transmission line, hand it to that function, and it does everything for you. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how to use it and then discuss some important things like convergence. And I'll give you a bunch of examples that you can try simulating to benchmark and make sure you're using TLCALC correctly. Here is how to use that function all in one slide. And you could copy and paste this. This is what your line of code looks like in your MATLAB program. Your job will be to build three two-dimensional arrays that really draws the picture of your transmission line. The first one, we'll call that ER, that's going to be your dielectric function everywhere. So if we want to simulate a microstrip, we might have all ones up here for air. And if we're maybe using FR4 as a dielectric, we'd have all 4.4s or 4.5s down here. So that's describing your dielectric function. Your other two arrays, these are describing the conductors. So we have two conductors. The first conductor will be your, your signal line or your, your microstrip line. So it's ones where the conductor is and zeros everywhere else. So it's really just a map of where the conductor is. And we have two conductors. So we also have a ground plane under here. So we'd have all ones going along this bottom row and all zeros everywhere else. So once we have these three arrays, We'll hand those to TLCALC along with DX and DY. Remember what those are. That's the size of the cell. DX is the width and DY is the height. And the very last parameter you give is either a one or a two, whether that's a single-ended or a differential line. So this is a single-ended line, so we're giving it a one. That's all you have to give it. And out come all of these different things for you. Um, now, if you only ever wanted the impedance, you would simply just say Z naught equals TL calc, but we can have all these other things for us. So we get the characteristic impedance, the effective refractive index, the distributed inductance, the distributed capacitance. And then if you wanted to visualize things, you also have access to the electric potential, the X component of the electric field intensity and the Y component of the electric field intensity. So in MATLAB, there's a nice command called quiver where you could hand it EX and EY and actually draw you know, little line vectors everywhere to see the vector nature of the field around the line. We can look at the electric potential, although it's more useful to visualize the electric fields. Uh, the electric potential is not the best thing to look at because we might be looking at it and saying, oh, wow, there's really big numbers here. There must be something really going on there. And that's actually not how to interpret the electric potential. In fact, it's where the electric potential is changing most rapidly. That's actually where the most energy is. So it's the derivative of the electric potential. And that's a little bit weird for us to visualize. But you know what? We have the electric fields. That is the derivative. That's the negative gradient of the electric potential. And this is physically what exists, what happens, where this is more intense. That's where we have more energy. So it's usually best to visualize the electric fields, not the electric potential. I would be looking at the electric potential only for troubleshooting or to just learn what that might look like. So TLCALC does all of this for you. Let's learn how to use this in more detail. Here's the header. So if you type help TLCALC, here's what would come up and just a reminder of everything. But basically ER, C1 and T C2, these are two dimensional arrays and they're basically describing the transmission line in the cross section. It's pictures of the transmission line. You have your cell size and then your transmission line type. So one for single ended, that's things like microstrips and two for differential like coplanar. And there's some more notes about a little bit about how things are done depending whether you have it set to single ended or differential. Uh, the short story is for single ended lines, the signal line is assumed to be C1 and that's set to one volt and C2 is, is assumed to be ground and set to zero. So notice there's one volt applied between those two. For differential lines, C1 is just the first conductor and it's set to positive 0.5. C2 is just the second conductor and it is set to minus 0.5. Notice again, there's one volt 
between those two lines. And in either case, the whole outer edge of the grid is set to zero. That's the Dirichlet boundary conditions. So the number values. Well, for our dielectric function, we can't have any numbers less than one. It's impossible to have a permittivity less than one. And I know some of you listening are thinking about metamaterials or near weird resonances and all this crazy stuff. And, and yeah, that's all true. But in this model, our permittivity cannot be less than one. So if air would be all ones and our substrate or wherever else we might happen to have dielectric, we set that to whatever it is. And so this is just a picture of our transmission line or, or the dielectrics around our transmission line. So for a microstrip, it would look something like this. Remember, we're not handling loss, so we can't make the permittivity complex. We're not also building conductivity or something anywhere. This model does not handle loss. Our first conductor, so for a microstrip, it's going to be located right above the substrate, and it's right here. So this either has ones or zeros, ones where the metals are and zeros where they're not. So this array is really not material properties. The permittivity definitely was. This is more just a map of where the conductor is. And the same thing for the second conductor. It's all just zeros and ones, not material properties, just zero where there's not conductor and one where there is. And these three arrays completely define our transmission line for this model. Grid resolution. So the question comes up, how big do these squares need to be? And the real answer to that is a story called convergence, which we'll talk about later. So for right now, we just need a good first guess. And what I normally do is pick the smallest dimension. So for our microstrip, it's either the width of the line or maybe it's the height of the dielectric, one of the two. And we want to resolve that with five to 10 points. Is that enough? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We'll find out later when we go to simulate it. And that leads us into our convergence discussion. So this is just a good place to start. So I'll pick that minimum size and divide it by a number like 10. So that's my first guess for dx. And for now, I just make dy the same thing. So that's a good first guess. We also have our spacer regions. So we have our microstrip sitting here. Notice all the space that we have to its right, to its left, and above the line. We don't need the space below the line because there's a ground plane here. And that completely isolates whatever might happen to be under here from the line. But on all the other sides, there's no ground plane isolating it. We have used Dirichlet boundary conditions. We are forcing that electric potential to zero at the edge of the grid. Well, if these edges are too close to the line, that electric potential isn't zero yet. But if we go ahead and force it to zero, we're going to get an inaccurate simulation of our line. So those spacer regions need to be large enough. Well, what is large enough? Again, this is going to be a convergence thing to actually determine accurately but I can give you some rule of thumbs. And the rule of thumb is if I look at the width of the line, call that W, typically this space needs to be at least three times that. And is that exact? No, it's not. It's just a good first guess. Convergence is how we determine that for sure. Thickness of the conductors. Well, in reality, real transmission lines, the conductors are tens of microns thick. But in your simulation, chances are the thickness of those cells when you calculate things might be 200 microns. Don't worry about that. We don't need to make a super high resolution grid. Just make it one cell thick and don't worry about going thinner. Is this the absolute most accurate way to do it? You know what? Probably not, but we're already making an electrostatic approximation. And we've also run this model up against rigorous codes and lots of other things, and it turns out really good. So don't worry about that. Yes, you'll be simulating a larger, thicker conductor than there may actually be. Uh, but in my opinion, that has minimal effect on the accuracy. Now, if you happen to have a very thick conductor, by all means, go ahead and fill in multiple cells with that and, and calculate that exactly. But don't worry about using a super high grid resolution to get the thickness of those metals correctly. Just, just make it one layer and that, that will work just fine. Single-ended versus differential. Well, single-ended lines, these are transmission lines that tend to have a big bulky ground and a little tiny signal line. 
So think about a coaxial cable. You got this big metal ground around the outside and your little signal line, right? It's not balanced in any way. It's, it's very asymmetric. Little line, big ground. Microstrip, you have your signal line and this big ground plane underneath. You have a strip line. You got your signal line embedded between two big planes of metal. You'll have a coplanar, and that could be grounded or not, but these metals off to the side usually extend off to infinity or at least very far, and your little signal line in the middle. All of those types of things are single-ended lines, and that last input parameter, TL calc, you're going to put a one. Well, other things are differential or balanced lines, and these tend to look very symmetric. So you might have a buried parallel plate where you just have two lines. So they're, they're perfectly equal with respect to each other. Uh, coplanar strips, even if it's a shielded pair, you know, we have this big bulky ground on the outside, but we still have two lines here. That's still a differential line. There's slot lines and there's a bunch of others, but all transmission lines either become single-ended or differential. And if we have a differential line, we give it a parameter of two. We give TL calc a parameter of two in that last position. Convergence. Up to this point, we have our rules of thumb for determining how big the spacer regions need to be and what the grid resolution needs to be. And what I said was those were just good first guesses. We really need to look at convergence to put final numbers there for what the spacer region needs to be and what the grid resolution needs to be. So a good first thing to do might be the spacer regions. So notice what's happening here. I'm, I'm keeping the grid resolution the same. So the width of that microstrip line is always five points, no matter, matter what's happening here. But what I am doing is I'm adding space and subtracting space around the line. And what I'll normally do is I'll make a good first guess, I'll run my simulation, and then I might double the spacer regions, run the simulation again. Then I'll triple and I'll run the simulation again. And I look at the trend of the answers that I'm getting from the simulation. And at some point, increasing those spacer regions isn't really affecting my answer much anymore. And I would call that converged. That's the actual accurate way to determine how big the spacer regions need to be. Next, I'll normally look at the grid resolution. Here, I'm keeping the spacer regions all the same size, the physical dimensions of, all, of everything the same size, but I'm changing how finely it's resolved. And I'll, I'll make a good first guess, maybe five points or two points for the width of the line. I'll run the simulation. I'll double that, triple that, quadruple that, quintuple that, and so on. And I will look at the trend of the transmission line parameters that I calculate. And I'll notice at some point, increasing the grid resolution further really isn't affecting the values that I'm getting for those transmission line parameters. And I would call that converged. That's the correct way to determine the grid resolution. Here we're getting more quantitative about this convergence thing for the spacer region and also illustrating the price that we pay for having larger spacer regions. So let's go ahead and look at this. We're plotting here the impedance of the line as we're increasing the size of our spacer regions. And so what we see is this trend here. Well, clearly we're approaching some kind of asymptote somewhere maybe around, I don't know, 53 ohms. So 53 ohms seems to be the value that our simulation wants to give us. And we will get that if we take our spacer region out super far, but here's the price that we're paying. The red line is showing simulation time. Notice what's happening to that. Our simulation time is going up, 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 up. So yes, we could operate with super huge spacer regions, but our simulation time would be unreasonable. So we kind of pick a spot here, and I might say somewhere around eight millimeters for whatever this line might be, might be that's where we're converged. Above that, yes, we will continue to get better and better results, but I would say how much better it gets is rather trivial compared to how much more simulation time we have to suffer. So it's up to us to pick where that convergence is. And a lot of times what I'll do for just preliminary simulations, 
uh, I'll pick a pretty low convergence at some point where you know reality is being conveyed, but it may not be the absolute best. And I'll I'll play with that. I'll play with my designs. And when I think I'm getting my designs somewhat near the end. I may at that point crank up my spacer regions or grid resolution and get that final answer, you know, somewhere, somewhere way out here. Let's do the same thing for grid resolution. We're, we're plotting impedance as a function of this parameter that I'm calling n res. For whatever reason, in all my codes, that one parameter that tells me how many points per dimension I'm resolving things with uh, is n res. So here, a uh, value of 30, I would be resolving the width of my transmission line, the, the microstrip with 30 points. And so that's how to interpret that. Here, what we see is when we have very low end res, well, now we're, we're overestimating impedance. But as we crank up our end res, this comes down and we can see, you know, we're approaching an asymptote. In this case, somewhere maybe around 50 ohms. Why do we get 53 on the previous slide, but 50 here? Well, that was because on the previous slide, I probably didn't have the right grid resolution yet, right? You have to pick one to start with. And so in the end, we might actually have to bounce back and forth a couple of times, do the spacer regions, look for convergence, then look for convergence to grid resolution, then go back and try the spacer regions again, then grid resolution. Two passes is usually enough for me, uh, but that's why sometimes we get slightly different results. But look here, the simulation time is actually even more sensitive to NRES, and it's, it's really starting to explode, and we have to pick sort of a sweet spot here. And here I picked an NRES of about 30. That's where the simulation time is still pretty quick, but, and, and I perfectly understand we'll get a more accurate simulation out here. But even out here, I could argue we could go further and get an even more accurate simulation. And you know we could we could do that forever. So really, we need to pick the sweet spot, and I'll pick it somewhere around an end res of 30. And again, what I might do if I'm just playing around the line, trying a whole bunch of different things, I might operate with an end res of more like 15. And when I think I'm starting to get near the end of my design and produce a final design, at that point I may start cranking it up. There's always a danger that you're missing something, but uh, that's how I tend to operate. Another thing is these are nice convergence curves. Another thing you might expect is this number might actually even jump around and look rather random. But even still, all these lines, whether they look like a nice exponential or they're jumping around, you will see and visually see that they do tend to converge as we're cranking up resolution or space or region size. This is the correct way to determine space or region size and the grid resolution, not those rules of thumb. Those rules of thumb is just to get you close to be a good first guess. Convergence is the way to do this. Hints, well, I call this hints, but it's actually only one hint that I have here. And that's something called scalability. Suppose we have a line and it does everything that you want, but it's the wrong frequency or the wrong size. Well, it turns out in electromagnetics, there is no fundamental length scale. So if I take that exact same transmission line and scale all physical dimensions, it behaves exactly the same way. I might have a microstrip line that's 10 meters wide, and I have the same one that's 10 microns wide. As long as it's scaled and equal otherwise, those two will actually have the same distributed inductance, the same distributed capacitance, same characteristic impedance, same phase constant, same effective index. The fields around the line will look the same, although scaled. So scalability is really neat. If we find something in literature that we really like, but it's at the wrong frequency, we can just scale it and move it to work at the right frequency. So keep scalability in mind. Benchmarking examples. These aren't really things that I'm gonna go through in any detail. They're just examples of lines that you can try on your own to practice TL calc replicate the answers that I have here. And you don't need to get real paranoid about matching the numbers exactly, but if you're off by 50%, there's something probably wrong with your simulation. So first is a microstrip line. And I have a microstrip that's almost two millimeters wide. I'm using FR4, so I have all ones. I have 4.4s here. My, my dielectric substrate thickness is 1.38. And here's what I get. And this is after it's converged. So I get a certain distributed inductance, distributed capacitance, my characteristic impedance pretty close to 50 ohms. Uh, 
And maybe this is exactly a 50 ohm line, and this model gives a 51 ohm line. And that kind of variation, that's to be expected. Uh, even if I ran a more rigorous simulation, I still would have questions about its accuracy and limitations and all that. So uh, getting paranoid about getting your answer to less than one ohm of accuracy, I I'm not sure that that's worth it. But anyway, here's a microstrip transmission line. A coplanar transmission line. What's a coplanar transmission line? That's where we have a signal line sandwiched between two large ground planes. Sometimes there's also a ground plane down here. I didn't do that here. Uh, I just chose for sake of something to do. I have a dielectric and air up here. We could have also put the, the same dielectric above and below. And here's the answers that I get. So this is roughly a 75 ohm line. A parallel plate transmission line. So I have one conductor and then another conductor right here. And so you, you can see the other one. And so this is about a 50 ohm parallel plate transmission line. Here's a coaxial transmission line where that inner conductor is uh, 0.5 millimeter diameter, outer conductor 3.2 millimeter diameter. Um, looks like it's a Teflon fill. So this might be the RG59 coax and we're getting a close to a 75 ohm impedance for this. A symmetric strip line. So we have a signal line in the middle filled with dielectric and we have a ground plane above and below. And here's a, we got 57 ohms for the dimensions that we've chosen here. So use these to benchmark your code and make sure everything's working and practice using it.